Hi everyone, it's me, Tim. Today I want to talk about writing good NPCs. Now I'm going to start with the big caveat that I've said on here many times. I am not a good writer. I've tried to be good. I've worked on it. It's something I can improve past a certain limited amount of I can write lore text, I can write short narration, but personal one-on-one -on -one dialogue, no, I'm not that good at. But I am good at seeing good writing of that category. Tons of my games have it. Other people did it. But in many cases, I was the one who looked at things, approved them, and sometimes sent things back and said, no, you can't do that. I don't want you to do that. And I think things got better because of it. So I'm not talking from a place of being a good writer, but maybe more of being a good narrative editor and helping people who were on my teams make better NPCs. And I've already talked about the, I hate amnesia in players. I hate sarcastic NPCs. There's a whole thing of tropes I didn't like. I made a video for why I didn't like tropes and then I made a video about subverting those tropes. So what I wanna do though is follow my own advice in not just complaining about stuff, but trying to be constructive and saying, okay, if you're here watching this video, you want to know what you can do to make a better, more interesting NPC. That's what I want to talk about. Now, I have tried to make better PCs, player characters, and I did that with, you know, low intelligent dialogue, um, adding flaws so your character had things that were specifically bad about them, that, ha that had mechanics attached to it. And so it just wasn't that you talked differently but maybe you had to act differently. And I talked about how in, my, in the supporting tropes, I talked about how some of that can apply to player characters as well. But what I wanna talk about here is how to, how to make an interesting NPC in one of your games. And I'm going to steer away from what I think are some of the more obvious ways people like to do it. People often, I think, steer into one of two common overused things with an NPC. One of them is they have an unusual physical characteristic. You know, a common one is they have an eye patch and they, they talk about how they lost an eye in battle with some enemy or it's the reason they're, you know, the evil general is because their eye got plucked out by some hero and now they're going to, you know, mess up everybody. Or, uh, and we see this one a lot, uh, their parents got killed. They're an orphan. It was traumatic. We've seen this a lot, you know, I was raised by my aunt or I was raised by my butler and lived in a cave full of bats. Suck it, Batman. I've seen this a lot. The next time a character says, my parents were killed in an auto wreck, I'm like, yeah, get in line behind all these superheroes whose parents are dead. I'm going to talk about other things. And the way I'm going to start is I'm going to tell you some little things about me. And then I'm going to tell you why. And I'm going to tell you why that works well for you. So I've talked about me being colorblind and how it's a weird kind of colorblindness. It's not something I was born with. And it's not just, you know, red, green or blue, yellow. It's full spectrum colorblindness. But I could see perfectly until I was 20. And then my color just started to fade away. Now, even though I'm the youngest of five kids, this happened to me first. But all my brothers and sisters have had this happen. And when I would go to an optometrist, they would frequently freak out and go, oh no, you have macular degeneration. We need to rush you into to an ophthalmology. I've seen two ophthalmologists. Both of them said I have no sign of macular degeneration. And I still get myself tested occasionally. What it seems to be is some mutation where my either my cones don't process light or my nerve ending into my brain doesn't send the signal. What's interesting about it is because of that, because colors are fading out, kind of becoming watercolor, my night vision's better. I never take a flashlight when I walk my dog at night. I have no trouble picking up after her. Um, I have no trouble driving at night, uh, even with the, with, I, I don't think I ever turn on high beams. However, I still have trouble when I approach an intersection at night going, ooh, is it the top light that's on or the bottom light? Because red and green is tough. One thing I don't know if I've mentioned is I've had years of speech therapy. Some people have commented that I say some words 
differently. And you're probably thinking, oh, it's because he grew up in Virginia or something like that. No, I had several years of speech therapy when I was a kid. I just said, I said R's and S's and a few uh, consonant combinations, some phonemes wrong. And I mean, I was, it was severe enough that I had my first speech therapist asked if my parents had immigrated here. Um, specifically, they asked me if they were from Scotland. I don't know what, it was mainly R's and S's, but I guess I rolled them or whatever. Um, interestingly, I wasn't bullied over this because it was, a, it happened that I went to speech therapy about the same, same time in elementary school where I was skipping forward a, a year or two in my reading and math classes. So my friends were used to me occasionally getting up and leaving the room for an hour. Because, you know, in elementary school, you tend to have all your classes in one room. And I'd get up, like reading would start, and I'd get up and go away. And then I'd come back. And then math would start, and I'd get up and go away. And then I'd come back. Well, they just assumed I was off to another one of these classes, where really what it was is I was getting up and going to an hour of speech therapy once a day. And it worked. It my uh, Most of my speech impediments went away. But it does show up occasionally in how I speak, which... Some people catch and it's unusual and a little memorable, but they don't know exactly what they're hearing. Similarly, I am right-handed, like most of you. I am in no way left-handed. My left hand is super non-dexterous. I can't write with it. I can't do a lot of things with it. However, there's some things that I do like a left-handed person would do. Like most, I discovered this, apparently most right-handed people grab the jar with their right hand and then unscrew it with their left. I don't. I grab it with my left hand and unscrew it with my right. I don't know why. I just do it this way. I think one of my sisters does it this way too, even though we're all right-handed. Another weird thing that a PE teacher told me is like when I was running to do soccer, usually when you're right-handed, you're also right-footed. But I would run to the soccer ball and then just kick it with whatever foot I wasn't standing on at the time. To me, this seemed like the reasonable thing to do. And I seemed to kick equally well, or you could probably say equally badly, with either foot. Was I ambidextrous? No. I was equally badly dexterous with either foot. It doesn't matter what foot I use. I'm not right-footed. Um, I also, I can't whistle. I've tried to whistle for years. I don't know if my mouth isn't shaped right or my lips or my tongue. I just can't really whistle. And interestingly, whistling hurts my ears horribly. Like it feels like someone's jamming an ice pick. And it's both ears and I had them check to see if I was had a tear in them. I do not. Whistling just hurts my ears. When I was getting tested, it turns out I can hear really high frequencies, kind of like teenagers do. Those mosquito speakers they put outside of some convenience stores to keep teenagers from loitering. I hear them too. They're annoying to me too. I, none of these are superpowers. I can't fight crime with any of these things. But let's take a look at what I just did. I just told you a lot of little things about me that are a little different. They're not major. You know, I'm not going to fight crime. I'm not really going to get bullied. But they're there. If you see what I did there, though, is you might feel a little more familiar with me. A little closer. Uh, people have talked on the comments about it's a parasocial relationship we have. Because I talk a lot. And I talk a lot about myself and my life. And you feel a little closer to me. Because I've shared things. That maybe other people in your life don't share with you. I talk about things. I explain things. You understand a little more about where I came from. And that makes you feel closer. Guess what, writers? This is the same thing for your NPCs. If you write NPCs in your game, they don't have to have something major, something big. They just have to have things they share with the player or they explain to the player. Like, this is this kind of happened to me and now i got to do this. It's It can be something small. And something small may be even better because now it's relatable. This is better than I've got a huge facial scar or missing an eye or my ears are chopped off or whatever. Or I'm an orphan. Because it's something that can still lead to major changes in how the NPC behaves. Even though it's a small little thing that you revealed. It's something that lets the player go, oh, I kind of see why you're doing this. Let me show you an example in play. I've mentioned I love the TV show Community. There was a, a uh, scene where a young Japanese kid who likes to do prank texts to the uh, community college dean kind of decides to come clean and tell the dean, hey, I've been, I've been tricking you all this time. And it led to this scene. The 
Jardine. Hello. Are you in trouble? Is everything okay? Is life hard everywhere? Is everyone alone? All the time. Are you at home, Jeffrey? Should I come over? You cannot come to me. I must confess on you. I am not Jeffrey. I understand. I rarely know who I am. No, I mean, I am not Jeffrey. Let it out. I am Takashi. I am teenage boy in Tokyo. I think we all are sometimes. I am sorry for making fun before, but now I need a friend. Why don't I bring you some olives tomorrow, Jeffrey? I am not Jeffrey. I am not the dean. I often think about that night. Such a small event, but ultimately, the moment that would lead me to becoming Ayuban, highest leader of the Yakuza. So, do you see what they did there? First of all, I love this kid. I love him. Plays video games, get, doesn't get along with his dad. But, I mean, his background is very relatable. You're like, I get this kid. You may have been this kid. And it's not a big thing that happened to him that he did this prank texting with the Dean. But it led him down a life path to a big event. He became leader of the Yakuza. And it's awesome. And you can kind of see the dots that led to it. So what is all this video about? I'm saying if you're making a game and you want to make some NPCs and you want to make them memorable and relatable and interesting, do what I just said. Do what you saw in that clip. Give, make the character relatable. He doesn't have to have something huge and scary and crazy happen to him. It could be a little thing that that's tilts your life path into a different direction and leads to something big. And that can be a much more memorable and interesting NPC than making another battle-scarred orphan. So I hope that helps.